Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to thank you for, for the organize to the organizers for the uh, kind invitation. Unfortunately, uh, I made a mistake, so I cannot be there uh, to see friends. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, some kind of uh, old some old work together with some uh, recent progress on you know understanding the. Uh, computational inversion with uh, Wasserstein matrix. So I say understanding in the talk, meaning that, you know, there are a lot of people that have contributed to this already. And I'm not the uh, the one that I can, again, you know, introduce this in the inverse problem community. I'm just trying to see, you know, why it works, you know, how it works, things like that. So uh, from that perspective, uh, there's not a lot of uh, new stuff. So this is based on a series of papers with uh, collaborators listed here. Uh, so I really will give you uh, mainly an uh, introduction and based on, uh, again, some uh, work I did with uh, Beyond Christ and Yunnan Young uh, a few years ago on this uh, problem in the linearized setting. We made a lot of progress recently on, for instance, uh, problems with unbalanced mass transport and also uh, problems of inversion with other metrics that is not the quadratic one that I'm going to uh, use to illustrate the idea. Uh, I'll see how fast I can go. So uh, the idea is uh, very simple. That is try to understand computational uh, solutions of problems like this. So you have an operator, you map some unknown sigma to data, and you want to invert this computationally because we don't have analytical uh, ways to do it. So in the general setup, this is done by uh, a minimization procedure where you try to minimize the mismatch between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, the, <clears throat> plus some regularization term, let's say, uh, when needed. So the mismatch could be measured in different metrics. And here I just say, you know, you just have some kind of uh, distance uh, that can measure that. And then you look for the uh, solution as the minimum of this functional here. Uh, one of the most popular or probably the most popular uh, distance or to measure this um, mismatch is the L2 uh, metric, L2 distance that we all use. There are a lot of advantages of this, of course, but in recent years, there are uh, many attempts try to replace this L2 metric with a different metric. And so this is uh, what I want to uh, mention here that is especially uh, the ones based on uh, optimal transport theory. But before that, let me just say that when we think about, you know, this uh, trying to select this distance uh, here to measure the uh, mismatch, what are the properties uh, ideally we want to have? So it is very clear that uh, we want this to be easy to compute uh, because many times solving, you know, evaluate F sigma, evaluating the data prediction is already very computationally expensive. So you want this to be easy to compute. And this is one of the advantage of L2. Uh, and also we want ideally a, a distance or a metric such that the landscape is very convex, right? But this uh, is something very hard to do for a general case because clearly this will depend on, you know, your forward map, right? Because if your forward map itself is nonlinear, you don't expect any generic metric that can make this landscape convex. Okay, so that's something that you can 
you know, you want to have, but it's very hard. And another thing you want to have is that uh, this kind of metric should be not so sensitive to high frequency information in the data. That is, you know, you want this to be less sensitive to noise, so to have robustness. But on the other hand, you want it to be sensitive to, you know, the information you want to reconstruct in sigma, right, in the unknown. So ideally, uh, I mean, there are others, but those are things that uh, are easy to, uh, how do you say, to, for us to, to want. Uh, so in terms of sensitivity to uh, high frequency noise, what I want to show you is that this kind of metric that I want to uh, look at is not sensitive to high frequency noise. Uh, but because of that, it's not sensitive to high frequency information in sigma either uh, in, in the general case. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, this kind of metrics, because of the non-sensitivity to high frequency information, it actually smooths out the landscape a little bit. I don't have very mathematical characterization of that, but you can look at this uh, from some of the numerics. So as I said, you know, this, there have been a lot of work uh, on this uh, using these uh, new metrics. I just listed some of these, mostly uh, the original work of thinking about using a different metric was in seismic imaging, uh, but uh, there are many other work also, so I give a few, uh, sorry if I missed yours. So uh, let me again quickly just uh, say what this metric is. So uh, I'll start with the easy one that is very easy to introduce. This is the, uh, just for people who have not seen this before, this is the quadratic Wasserstein metric that I'm going to use, which is basically defined as follows. So you have, uh, they say a density or a, a signal F, you want to, you know, transport this, transform this in G. The way you do it is you take a transport, measure preserving transform to map this coordinate X to a coordinate Y, TX, okay? And you measure the average or the uh, cost of this uh, process, which is X minus Y square in here. That is, you know, the, the transportation cost is proportional to the distance you travel if you think of TX as Y. Uh, so you try to find a transportation that minimizes this average or total cost here when you transform F to G. So this F is, again, the uh, weight there. Uh, so there's an easier way to uh, look at this. Uh, again, if you have not seen this, that is the uh, dynamic formulation, which is as follows. So you have, again, F, you want to transport it to G. You view this as a process of transportation where this zoo is the density. Again, your initial density is F here. Your final density is G. And you have a velocity uh, field or vector field, whatever you want to call it, that uh, solves this transport process. And you minimize the uh, total energy here, the energy, energy here. And that is the distance between F and G. And you can make all this precise etc cetera, etc cetera. but i just want to uh give you a quick view on what this is so this is how you uh measure the uh, you know if f is your model prediction g is your data this is how you measure the difference between the uh these two quantities so uh as i said you know there, there are two important things uh when you try to do this for inverse problem. Uh, one is to look at the impact of if I change, you know, my L2 metric to a metric like this, uh, what is the impact of this on the solution of the inverse problem, right? So you could always say that, uh, you know, for 
most of the metrics, if you solve problem perfectly, they should not uh, uh, change the uh, global minimizer of the problem that is the, uh, the true solution. So you will you know, have a perfect solution. But when you have noise data, you don't minimize things to the uh, you know, zero, that will introduce an uh, impact on the inversion results. Okay, so that is the first thing you want to understand. The second thing which is much harder to understand is what is the impact on the landscape? That is, if you take a different, you know, they say you take this as your, you know, a distance and you put this as your objective function, is your objective function constructed this way uh, much better, more convex in whatever sense than the L2 case. This is a harder problem uh, to analyze, uh, but I think you can get a lot of heat. So I try to address the first uh, question uh, very quickly uh, by looking at, so you want to, uh, again, see if I take this metric as uh, my uh, measurement of data discrepancy, what is the solution, optimal solution I get uh, look like, right? Compared to, for instance, the L2 one. So uh, the first thing you can think of is to say, okay, let's assume that we're lucky enough that we solve this minimization problem and uh, we find somehow the, the solution that is close to the, you know, true solution that is around the global minimizer. Uh, again, this is just to say that suppose I'm, I can solve this minimization problem. So just look at the, uh, the impact of the uh, metric on the final solution. So in that case, you can linearize this metric. Uh, so the way you do it is very easy. You assume that uh, at some point your sigma, your unknown will be such that your f is very close to g. So this metric can be linearized. Uh, if you just do a simple linearization, what you can see is that this metric is, let me just say that is equivalent to uh, uh, something like this. Okay, so this metric can be computed in this way. So if f and g are the signals uh, you have, G is data of your prediction. Uh, so your distance is can be expressed as this. You have gradient F square weighted by F integrated of that, where this phi of this Laplace equation. So if you just take F to be constant, say you linearize, you know, you're matching two things that are close to constant, then you see that this is just the H minus one. Uh, dot h minus one uh, metric. That is f, the distance between f and g is basically this. Okay, again, when I say this f is constant, I'm trying to simplify the picture here. Uh, so this, of course, when f is not constant, this introduces a coupling between different frequencies of the information, but for the moment, just assume f is constant. Okay, so this is basically h minus one. Uh, so, well, if you have h minus one, then we can understand what's going on uh, because we can basically, if I take a linear inverse problem, so which is this, I changed the notation somehow a little bit here. So this is the linearized version of the original problem. So I have m equals g. I'm trying to uh, just, again, minimizing the difference between these two measured in uh, H minus one norm. So here you can just, because all the H norms has nice Fourier representation, you can look at this in a general framework of any HS norm. So this will give you a contrast later about, you know, uh, what different metrics uh, introduce here. So, you know, again, I look at a linear problem. I have uh, this, linear metric here. Uh, let's further assume, for instance, this A is diagonal in a Fourier uh, domain. If it's not a diagonal, you just have to uh, work a little harder, but nothing essential change. Uh, so in that case, you know, the minimization is really the following thing that is you're minimizing uh, 
m minus g the hs norm of that uh, you can write this in Fourier domain and then you can invert it because it's a linear problem in a linear metric this is uh, the standard you know uh, this square weighted this square so you can see that in the Fourier domain okay because i assume the operator is diagonalized uh, a diagonal in the Fourier domain so you have a frequency by frequency inversion, which in the free, uh, in, in, in physical space is something I'll show you in the next slides. But what this tells you is really that, you know, if you are inverting with H uh, minus one that I showed you before, where S is a negative one, you have your data uh, at G here, the free modes of the data is multiplied by a factor, this uh, standard factor here with a negative two uh, exponents there, which means that if you think about the high frequency part of your data, that was multiplied by a huge or a prefactor, not huge, one over the huge prefactor, a small prefactor. So this smooths out the high frequency part, suppress the high frequency part of the game uh, in the before you do the inversion process. Okay, this is just a naive uh, observation. If you instead uh, you minimize this in a positive, you know, S norm, you minimizing a sublet, uh, you know, H1 norm, then you are emphasizing the high frequency component of the data before you inverse. Uh, in any case, so uh, this naive calculation tells you roughly that if you minimize, if you take a strong metric here, when you solve the, uh, when you form your minimization problem, you are emphasizing the high frequency information in the inversion. When you use a weaker metric here, you are suppressing the high frequency information, which again, if you think about it, we all know that, but somehow, uh, this was not connected to the uh, Wasserstein case when people first look at this. So uh, in the physical domain, this is what it looks like. So you basically, again, you know, if you take S to be negative one, you basically uh, smooth out your data before you do the inverse. You can argue again in the perfect world, you know, this prefect is going to be canceled out if you do this inversion in a perfect sense. But again, when you have noise data, you don't do this exact inversion, you will have to stop at some iteration, then this makes, uh, it makes a difference. That is, do you, if you suppress this high frequency first, then do the inversion, or you emphasize the high frequency part, then do the inversion, that makes a difference. So S equals zero is the L2 case. All right, so uh, based on that, you can actually know uh, what the impact of this is on the uh, reconstruction result. You can show that the optimal reconstruction you can get, I'm not going to uh, read this, but basically what I'm saying is that the optimal reconstruction you can get with uh, S that is negative here is worse than the one you get with S that is positive here. So this is uh, what I'm trying to say here. This is uh, a result that was done uh, a few years ago already. So again, this very simple naive linearization uh, tells you the main feature here. So I neglected the, uh, you know, if you really want to look at this as a asymptotic result, you need to include this coupling factor here, F here, uh, that frequency content of this F clearly is going to make a difference because you will have to introduce coupling between different frequencies. But if your F, if your signal or your, your forward map is not mixing low frequency information in your sigma to a very high frequency information in your sigma, if you are not doing crazy things like that, the picture you see from this very naive analysis is almost correct, okay? So let me again uh, just show you uh, what you see here uh, in numerics. So if you look at uh, uh, this is a uh, inverse problem where I'm trying to reconstruct uh, diffusion coefficient, uh, absorption coefficient in uh, this uh, naive 
elliptic problem with measurement that is internal that contains sigma. So this is sigma u here, I measure sigma u here. This is a simplified model of some applications. Uh, so you try to reconstruct from this sigma. So if you really have no noise and you look at this from, you know, by solving L2 mis minimat mismatch, H minus one was a stand uh, two, you get almost the same thing. But when you have a noise data, L2 give you noisy reconstruction, the the uh, H1 and the Wasserstein 2 quadratic one give you a smooth version of that. Uh, those are not really the optimal one, but something close to the optimal one. Okay, so this in 2D, you see the same thing. Uh, so when I talk about these people always ask, uh, ask you know, uh, okay, what is the difference if you, you only care about this frequency uh, damping in these metrics, what is the difference between this and, uh, you know, a regularization with, uh, you know, uh, a stronger norm here. So here is a comparison that tells you that you are doing very different things uh, when you change the mismatch function on the left and when you change the uh, the regularization. So you can, as I said, you can take, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you can try to uh, put a strong assumption on your unknown so that you can put regularization like this and just compare what these two factors are key, uh, give you. So, you can see easily, I, again, in a linearized setup that when you change this in the metric, okay, you are doing things on every frequency of, it, or, uh, uh, of the forward map. But when you are changing the, uh, when you are changing the, uh, the uh, regularization, you are only changing the uh, highest frequency, which is to say that one is multiplicative, the other is additive. Okay, so this is the main difference between these two. And the one changes the landscape because this is essentially a dimension reduction. You are saying that the only low, again, I'm talking about the case when S is negative one. So you are saying that uh, the low frequency part of the contents are more important than the high frequency content. So you are essentially reduce the dimension of the problem. And this one, again, is not doing the same thing. Okay, so uh, this is what's in the Fourier space. So uh, another thing, so again, that was, you know, in frequency, how everything was tuned. But that's not, uh, you know, the only thing you care about. Here, I just give you an example of this uh, reconstruction in the uh, Wasserstein 2 metric. Uh, in a case when your M, the unknown that you are looking for is highly localized. Suppose your M is mainly supported in a domain uh, with size epsilon. Uh, so all the total mass are, you know, are, are concentrated at uh, a very small ball. That is, you're looking for a very localized object. And a forward model is a very general uh, deconvolution type of setup. So this K could be uh, actually uh, anything, uh, any reasonable kernel. So it turns out that in this case, if you are really looking at that, what you can show is that uh, this Wasserstein metric uh, give you a convex problem if you're looking for two points scatter essentially in this case if it's not really point it's just highly localized it's asymptotically quadratic so which means again you know if you want to locate a point source locate a highly oscillate a highly concentrated uh, target inside a medium uh, this is a good metric to uh, to use Okay, this with respect to the location again, you know, depend on the size. If the size is too big, then this there are other effects that pollute this. But if it's really highly oscillatory, that's what it have. So, 
one of the uh, thing I didn't talk about is that, uh, you know, if you look at the traditional uh, Wasserstein uh, two metric here, you need the F and G to have the same total mass, uh, which is okay if you want to so you solve an inverse problem, you know, at the end of the uh, iteration when you match F to G, right? But during the iteration process, you don't have F, G to be, to have the same total mass. So people always uh, question the use of this in the inverse problem. That's why uh, you have to normalize your data along the process. But normalization actually killed a lot of uh, the properties you see in this uh, business. So people then say, why don't we do this unbalanced uh, transportation. Okay, so this is <clears throat> to say that during the iteration, during my you know reconstruction process, I don't have you know a total mass to be preserved, so I could use uh, this unbalanced one. So uh, let me again, I don't have time to really talk about all the unbalanced business, but there's a very easy. Uh, uh, way to see uh, how do you introduce some balance that is started with again the banamuba brainier formulation fluid dynamics formulation so what you do here is that you have the original optimal transport where we, you want to transport f to g uh, by this transport equation so here if you want to allow some imbalance between f and g you can put a source term here so that you allow some mass to be absorbed. There are many different ways to do this, but uh, this is the fundamental idea. You know, depend on you know how you want your source to behave. You have different versions. Okay, so this is if you use this metric during the iteration process when F and G are do not have the same total mass, you can still evaluate this metric. Uh, which solves the problem of normalization. Okay, so this is the essential uh, thing there. You don't need to worry about the rest. There are many different ways to, to as I said, to do this relaxation. So depending on the form of the source, uh, I listed a few here because I want to put them in the same framework. Uh, but let me skip all those. Uh, the point is that I want to look at, you know, uh, the impact of imbalance in this game. So one way to look at that is again, you know, try to see uh, this asymptotically. So try to linearize things. If you remember, when we have the balanced case, we linearize and we have a metric that is asymptotically just h minus one, weighted h minus one, like this. So you are minimize. Uh, I mean, you're, you're computing the cost like this with where this phase is a solution of this elliptic problem. Uh, so if you have a source term in the transport equation, you will see the one that I show you can be linearized into uh, this uh, form where you are computing essentially the same thing, but with an additional term that is proportional to how much mass you absorbed. So the, uh, the, the fee quantity here solves this elliptic equation where compared to the previous one, you just have an absorption term. And this absorption term is very special because you absorb only on the zero frequency. So this is the integral differential equation. But again, you know, naively, if you just look at it, you understand what's going on here. So uh, they are linearization of the other metrics, but let me just uh, summarize this to say that if you introduce a uh, mass imbalance, what you do is nothing but shifting the, uh, you know, adding an absorption in your, uh, in your uh, metric there. So, you know, adding some terms like this, okay. Uh, so in the Fourier domain, you are just shifting the uh, frequency by the, the amount you absorb, depending on which, you know, uh, way you do the uh, unbalance. I have different versions here. Nothing matters besides the fact that in the 
balanced case you see here, I have one of zeta squared, this is a Fourier mode. In the unbalanced case, I will always have one over something plus this. So you have a shift of this. Uh, so what are the impact there? So here, I let me just show you some numerics. I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, so let me just, again, show you one reconstruction here. So this on the left, you have this uh, sigma you are looking at. And on the right is the uh, iteration process to uh, reconstruct the images. You see that the reconstruction is very smooth when you start this iteration. Uh, why is it so slow? Okay. So when, when you increase the, uh, you know, when you let this involve, you gradually recover some uh, higher oscillatory part of the game. At the beginning, it was very sm uh, smooth and later on you add this uh, higher order, higher frequency. I didn't, of course, in this particular example, I didn't let it run through to the end. If you just let it run to the end, you have recover more and more uh, high frequency uh, part. Uh, this is just a, a better example that shows you, you see at the beginning, you have very smooth reconstruction and gradually you add the another mode of this uh, in the unknown. So this is just a highlight of that. That is if you have your reconstruction in this metric, what you see is the following. So this is a case where your unknown has two frequencies. One, you know, you, you just design a sigma that has frame mode two, frame mode 30, and you look at, you can monitor the reconstruction and you see that uh, the blue curve is the reconstruction of the first mode, which is reconstructed in the very early iterations, but the second one, the 30th mode get reconstructed well only after 500 iterations. So one is very fast, the other is very slow. And you can actually, we have a lot of other numeric examples there that illustrate this. You, you can have a sequence of frequency and you will have a sequence of uh, reconstructions. So this you can start, think of it as a multi-scale process uh, in the sense that you first recover low frequency ranges, larger scale features, and then you add other scales to this. This is done automatically by the metric. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, is intrinsically uh, nice if you solve, for instance, wave type of problems where you want to uh, have low frequency match the first. All right, so again, uh, there are a lot of more uh, results here, but let me show you one more here where the uh, this damping in the high frequency actually stabilize the uh, reconstruction. So this is the case where I have a curve I want to reconstruct. I show you that uh, you know you can reconstruct this uh, starting from a crazy uh, initial guess like what I show you on the right. Uh, I don't know why this one is not running here. So you see that even when you start from this crazy uh, initial guess uh, you see on the right, you still get uh, reconstruction to the uh, almost, I mean, not, not a perfect one, but uh, to the uh, something very similar to what you see on the left. The, the right one, if you do a L2, it just blow up. You, you can put a lot of regularization to stabilize, et cetera, but this was then to really give you a, a automatic way to do that. So uh, I have more 2D results. Let me not talk about that. I'm running out of time. So uh, this 
parties on the unbalanced uh, case. Basically, the uh, unbalanced results are the same as the balanced case, except that you dump the high frequency a little bit more. Uh, the uh, frequency disparity, what I call this multi scale feature, is still there. So, in terms of landscape, you know, if you think about the uh, I don't know how you view this, but it's impossible to view. But if you look at this picture here, this tells you that when you solve the minimization problem, the landscape is very nice at the beginning because you are only only the low frequency part of your uh, unknown is reflected in the objective function. It's not sensitive to the higher part, right? But gradually, you are going to the your landscape is going to get more and more complicated during this iterating process. That's one way to uh, to uh, look at the impact on the landscape. All right. So another issue that people keep asking is that uh, you know if you want to, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, one of the problem with this metric is L2 is very easy to compute. But here you see that if you want to compute the in the fluid dynamics formulation, let's say, uh, let me go to, in this case, if you want to evaluate it, you know, at each, uh, you know, each value of sigma, you want to evaluate the mismatch, you need to use this formulation you need to solve the transport equation and uh, compute this quantity. So this makes the whole computation very uh, expensive. So if I still want these type of features that I just talk about and don't want to spend this much time on the uh, computing of the metric, what can I do? And most people would prefer to do this with uh, Wasserstein 1, which unfortunately I, I should have uh, introduced it, but I didn't. So basically what I'm saying is that you want to uh, actually uh, use W1 instead of you know W2 that I show you here. And it unfortunate that the analysis I just show you cannot be carried out to the uh, W1 case, even though intuitively uh, you would expect that they behave very similarly. So uh, in a recent work, we were able to uh, take a different approach to analyze this phenomenon that I just introduced uh, by using uh, a weighted uh, Fourier, weighted Fourier equivalence between the Wasserstein metric and a weighted Fourier uh, metric. So let me quickly tell you what it is. Uh, so basically, if you if I have the Fourier modes of uh, functions, imagine this lambda is a vector, which is a Fourier modes of a function. Uh, I can define essentially the uh, a metric. Uh, that is weighted like this. On each Fourier mode, I put a weight here. Uh, if you think about the W2 that I introduced before in the Fourier representation, that's exactly what happened, right? So if I have a Fourier mode, I can just introduce a weighted metric here. Uh, by doing that, so it depends on, you know, can you the, the the thing that I want to introduce is that if I, again, think about lambda as the uh, Fourier transform of my function vector, if I introduce this quantity with a appropriate V weight, can I make an equivalence between, you know, the Wasserstein metric and this new uh, Fourier, weighted Fourier metric? The answer is yes, and some conditions, uh, so I just show you that there is a equivalence. You can essentially bond your W2, WP, any for any P between one and two uh, with this weighted Fourier, uh, uh, Fourier uh, matrix there. So this beta one, beta is the Fourier transform of F, 
beta prime is a Fourier transform G. You can show this equivalence. You can bound this from the left also, which on the left, you can do it for uh, any P. So I separated this. So that there's a lower bound like this with a weight that is one over K to the P's. Uh, so this is the vector norm of P. You can replace it with just two with infinity. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but basically what I'm saying is that there is equivalence uh, between the WP metric for any P between one, two, uh, and this weighted uh, free norm of the uh, of the difference. Okay, so based on this, you can have uh, uh, analysis that is similar to what I uh, presented at the beginning. That is, uh, you can show that the reconstruction with no matter W1 or W2 or W any P has very similar property. Uh, so this is the resolution. Uh, again, you don't need to care about the detail that basically degenerate to the case of uh, W2 when Q is two. So uh, Q is the uh, is the uh, conjugate exponent of P, one over P plus one over Q is one. Uh, so you can show that exactly the same phenomenon happens uh, when you invert this problem with a WP uh, metric. That's basically what I'm trying to say here, using a different tool. Uh, so you have the smoothing effect that is similar to what you have in the extreme case of P equals one, which is K equal to, uh, Q equals infinity. This term will disappear. So you will only see the, uh, the uh, property from the operator and the unknown itself. So you have a smooth reconstruction uh, but uh, in, a, in a way that is very similar to the uh, W2 case. So you can use, if, if smoothing is the only thing you care or the stability is the only uh, factor you care, you can use a cheaper, uh, you know, uh, metric. By cheaper, I mean the W1 has more uh, faster algorithms to compute. It's easier to compute. Uh, I think I ran out of time. I stop here. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So that's a very good question. Actually, there is a connection there. Uh, so one way you can think of this is, again, think about this from the linearized case. So this is just to say that I actually introduced, I commented out their slides. I actually introduced a correlation. So just look at this one. I think it's very clear. So what this tells you is that uh, you know, instead of if you formulate everything, let's say you take a, you know, whatever prior and you take the noise model to be a Gaussian, right? So if you do the same thing with this W, whatever, W2, then you are introducing a covariance matrix in the, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, posterior, you know, in the, in the likelihood part. So you are 
inverting or whatever for unknowns that are correlated whose correlation is determined by this but this is only uh, again at the uh, minimum right so during this process your covariance keep changes right? this is why uh, so there's a, a you know like an iterative process like this that you can use to interpret that i think uh, there was a research at Yunnan Yang and someone else did this Yes. Oh, because it's not completely a decoupled problem, right? So when you match the low frequency part, you overmatch. So which means that, uh, you know, you have to uh, compensate it with something else. So that's exactly uh, why you see this. So this is, uh, first, <laughs> let me explain. This is the error in the reconstruction uh, in the process. Okay, so the blue one is the, if you look at the formula here, this is the true sigma in that mode minus the, uh, the reconstruction in that mode. Okay, so this is not like the objective function itself. So that's why you can have this, you know, not monotone behavior. But more importantly, because if you look at, you know, just W2, right? W2, again, in the linearized set, what you are saying is that, uh, you know, all the gradients, if you look at the gradient and you do a Fourier transform, you multiply the higher frequency, you know, every frequency by one over K square, I mean, 1D. So this means that at the beginning, when I match the signal, I essentially neglect the, you know, the, the, the higher frequency in the gradient. I'm trying to match this with a smooth, uh, you know, field. Of course, you cannot match it perfectly because your true problem really came from with contributions from both, you know, uh, low and high, right? So you overfit in the low frequency part. You don't completely neglect it. If you have completely decoupled it, like what I show you before, then it's, it's, it should not be like that. So this one is, I, I forgot to say, this is a fully nonlinear problem. I didn't, the analysis was done in a naive setup, but this is for a problem like this, where you have this diffusion equation, you have sigma. So the sigma you write it in, you, you have, uh, you know, two modes there. So the problem is still nonlinear. You cannot match the data perfectly with only uh, one of the frequency. That's a very good question. So you, you certainly don't do this exact thing like what I said, like, uh, you know, if you diagnose your, your operator, then you do it frequency by frequency. This is not like that. But roughly speaking, you see that because of the one over K square factor there, you are doing roughly speaking, low frequency, then high frequency. I think that's what you see here. Yeah, there's roughly speaking, that's besides technical issues, yes. Mm. 
no, this is not uh, not our. Uh, we are not the first one. So uh, there were. Uh, this was really discussed in these two papers. So this uh, Niels Witt and uh, Bruce said they have uh, this result for the wavelet basis. And the first paper was done in the Fourier case, but for a very specific case uh, of, you know, you, you need the function to be very special there. So you can generalize the first result to band limited functions, which is, I think is sufficient for, for applied purpose. But uh, you can work a little harder to actually get what we said there. Uh, this equal, again, this weighted thing is very strange and not completely to what we said because the the weight here you see that you are not just taking your uh your function and you take the uh, k right so this weight is actually the absolute value of that k so it's not completely what i'm saying is not completely true that you know this is the same thing as a negative sublift norm it's some kind of twist the you know norm there So, okay, so, so I didn't say that. I didn't say taking off is not optimal there. I'm just comparing these two. So look at this, okay, this is what I said. So if you change your metric, right, replace L2 by weighted L2, so in this case, it's basically HS, right? And then you look at the same thing. If you do a, you know, taken off with instead of L2, you do this with H S H beta, whatever you want to call it. What I'm saying is not taken off is not optimal. What I'm saying is that they have different impact on the reconstruction. When you change the metric here, you don't in an ideal case, you don't change the solution. Taken off with any gamma, you change the solution. So I'm saying that one is a multiplicative process here, the, because you do this to the operator. This is how you apply this to the operators, right? And this gamma here is, this term is where it came from taken off. This is how you change the game, right? So you see that if I take a gamma to zero, in an ideal case, when you change the metric, you don't change the solution. When you put a non-zero gamma, you change the solution. This, again, a multiplicative process compared to an additive process in the frequency domain. That's what I said. I didn't say optimal. Uh, Tikhonov is not uh, uh, optimal here. Maybe I, I missed. I said something else that uh, were not correct. Sorry for that. Thank you.